The next segment I want to talk about and how the future isn't looking very good, is it? It's uplifting today. We're really bringing that lively energy after the Queen has passed. Now let's talk about how terrible the future might be. Yes. Yes. Uh, so before we begin, um, if you want to support us, go over to lotusies.com and check out my speech that I gave at the Watan uh, conference called The Word and the Shire. This is what I think people on the right need to be doing and my analysis of the circumstance. And one of the things I was really proud about with this is being able to tie everything that we're doing onto the historical continuity of England, basically. It's, you know, one of those things that we don't think about, but we maybe should, because you'll notice that everyone's like, well... I'm black and I find that offensive. I'm Irish and I find that offensive. So, okay, well, in the wake of the way that the sh- the the socialists, I was going to swear, have reacted in the death of Queen Elizabeth, I'm English and I find that offensive, right? Is that not a valid way of approaching this? If this is your paradigm, shut up, basically, is how I feel about it, you know? And so am I allowed to articulate this perspective? And so that's essentially a, a sort of like look at postmodern Englishness. <laughs> Uh, and I, but I think it's important. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, much more your wheelhouse, I think, Chris. Uh, things are getting bad, aren't they, socially? There are more single working women than ever, and that's changing the US economy. An article on CNN yep. here. Because uh, this was from 2019, but it uh, will build on it. Uh, 45% of women are expected to be single by 2030. That's right, is, is it not? Or maybe uh, WS. Morgan Stanley. Morgan correct. Stanley, yes. Yeah, yeah well, I mean. He, The more worker drones that they have, the better. You know, if they can continue to make women believe that they need to buy bags and shoes to impress people that they hate at a job that they don't enjoy, the more that they're going to be able to rinse money out of them. Now, I I put a clip out about this on my channel. I know, I saw it. That's what inspired this. Which which got people really, really riled up. It, It ventured into areas of Twitter that I'm not usually exposed to, and people got very upset. I think the biggest... The the main point I want you to make with this, apart from the fact that this is a very nefarious capitalist viewpoint Mm. from certain companies in order to maximize their labor force and squeeze as much out of them as possible, is that it causes people to view mothers as second-class citizens. That, for me, is the thing which is most uncomfortable Mm. about it. My mum stopped working for eight or nine years, and we were a very working-class household, so it was three people living on three quarters of a person's wage, right? It wasn't as if I came from some lavish background. And I really, really appreciate all of the effort that my mum did. And for someone to say that she was conned, rubed into being some willful uh, tool of the patriarchy, (laughs) this cis heteronormative patriarchal superstructure, which is misogynistically keeping all women down, that makes me feel very, very uncomfortable. I don't like that at all. By what standard? Like, by the standard of working in an office... Like, that's the question. So, I mean, like, the, the way they frame everything about this, right? One of the biggest barriers that remains to female workers is access to childcare. It's like, great, yeah, you, your children should be in a daycare and you should be in the office. And it's because of the lack of being able to put the children in the daycare that you're not in the office. It's like, but who wants to be in the bloody office? I don't know why. I asked Will Costello this, who was the guy that was on the show with me that day. And mm. I said, what is it about this male default which mm. is being pushed as the thing which is aspirational for everybody to go toward why is it the case that people should see attainment in work and being disagreeable and being hyper industrious within the workplace Mm. as the thing that everybody is supposed to aim for now would it be good feminism takes men as the default yes that's would it, it be is. would it be good for everybody to have a degree of financial independence? Yes, absolutely. Especially given the fact that a single person's working wage is now kind of difficult to sustain mm. a, a household on. And no matter how much you try and date up and across, there are not going to be an unlimited number of men that can sustain an entire household. Mm. So yeah, women need to be able to contribute in that way. But it should not be the case that a woman that is 20 years old and maybe finishes a university degree and thinks, I really can't wait to be a mum considers herself a second-class citizen. That, to me, is actively disincentivizing us creating the generation which is going to look after all of us when we get old. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's just, like, who does it benefit? Because, I mean, if I asked you to estimate, do women respect men who earn more than them or less than them, uh, you know the answer. Every man knows the answer. There is basically double to three times the increased likelihood of a marriage 
uh, ending in divorce when the woman earns more than the man. Yeah. There is a statistically significant increase in the use of erectile dysfunction medication. Women fake more orgasms with really? men that don't earn as much as them. Now, that actually could be laid at the feet of the fragile male ego that they're actually trying yeah. to do it to protect. I think it's a lot more about it's an, in- an in- inherent power imbalance. Yeah. That And the bottom line is that most men don't care about what the woman does for a job. Most women do care about what the man does for a job. Yeah. Would you date a man that is unemployed, as was asked of most women, and more than three quarters of women said no, that they wouldn't? I, I But if not, men were asked, would you date a woman who's unemployed, they'd be like, it'd be preferable, actually, yeah. In some ways, yeah. <laughs> Wait, the, here's the other thing as well. Almost all women, when surveyed, said that the, getting to the stage where they can stay at home if they want to hmm. is an aspirational life goal <clears throat> for them. My grandmother's life is an aspirational life goal. Chop wood, carry water, man. Yeah, no, I totally agree. But the thing is, I mean, like, if women weren't being encouraged en masse, well, you've all got to get degrees and get jobs working in the corporate bigwig headquarters in London, then maybe this would be easier. Well, you're going to have two women for every one man completing a four-year US college by 2030. Mm. Women aged 21 to 29 are out-earning men by £1,111 per year on mm-hmm. average. All of these things, fantastic. Like, women for a good while... Are they fantastic, though? Women for a good while weren't able to earn their fair share. They didn't have the equality of access that they did in the workplace, and that required a pendulum swing. I fear that it is swinging back, and downstream from this, this is the topic of Louise Perry's work, of Mary Harrington's work, of Will Costello's work, of David Buss. This is part of the broader mating crisis, which is that a proliferation of high-performing women and a reduction in the number of men that are above and across from them means that it is very difficult for them to find someone they're fundamentally attracted to. Mm. Women are fundamentally attracted to men who have more status, more education, and more resources than they do. If you do not have that, women are going to have to date down. They're going to have to reduce the hypergamy. They don't like dating down. They don't. However, they're starting to. There's a little bit of evidence that suggests that women are beginning to date down. However, this is going up in line perfectly it is correlated exactly with increases in extramarital affairs for women only so women are prepared to date down but they're also going to because presumably they're struggling to remain as attracted to the guy and for the people that haven't been introduced to evolutionary psychology and these precepts before it can sound like a very sort of transactional sterile way of looking at relationships and this is on average this is not for me to say that Mm -hmm. you are not able to get into a relationship with a man who doesn't earn as much as you and have a fantastic marriage that is absolutely true however on average this is not the way that this seems to work and the statistics bear this out women women want men they can look up to that's what it is they they genuinely do and why that would be a bad thing i'm not sure well it's well if you're a feminist then what you're uh, establishing there is that women actually want a superior man that's not equality. That's horrendous from the feminist perspective. But it turns out that the feminist perspective isn't really representative of what women actually want. I saw a meme a little while ago that said um, feminists a couple of decades ago have got us to the stage where men are able to smoke weed and stay on the couch playing yeah. Xbox all day and consider that an equitable relationship. Yeah, that's a win. Yeah. That, how's that good for women? Well played. Yeah. That doesn't. F- and yeah, man. The, the main thing for me is is the celebration of motherhood. I yeah. think that 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 really is that should be front and center. Well, let's talk about the celebration of motherhood. How many children do you think people are having these days? <sighs> Not enough. Yeah. It's going to be more women are uh, without children than with children by the age of thirty than. Yep. Uh, that's the first time in history, 50.1%. Yes. Uh, and uh, when asked, uh, this was in 2021, uh, 44% of non-parents uh, between 18 and 49 say they uh, it's unlikely they'll have uh, children someday, uh, which is an increase of 7% uh, from the 2018 survey. So in three years, people are yeah. even more unlikely to have children. Uh, 74% of younger adults, uh, sorry, adults younger than 50 who are already parents, of course, say they're unlikely to have more kids. And uh, a majority of non-parents, 56%, uh, younger than 50, say that it's unlikely they'll have children some days. They just don't want kids. It's like, oh, okay. It really blows my mind that something which has been baked into our evolutionary precepts Mm. for so long has been undone by a few decades of culture. I think it shows just how mediated our normal desires are. Survival and reproduction, two things, Mm. right? That's it. And we've abandoned the reproduction bit. It's really, it's almost impressive. It it really does blow my mind. And I I keep on speaking to these guys that are at the forefront of the research on this. David Buss, the grandfather of evolutionary psychology. Jeffrey Miller, who's probably one of the fathers of it as well. Mm. 
how is it that culture is able to mediate and negate and dissolve so many of these impulses that we've I think, got? I think what it is, is because it's the difference between pleasure and satisfaction, right? So it's it takes a long time and a lot of work to be satisfied with something. Uh, but there there's a kind of sublime feeling about it that you can't really replicate. However, what you can do is obscure that by triggering dopamine receptors you yeah. know take this drug have the sex the modern the devil is cheap dopamine it, 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 exactly right that's exactly right and so when you get someone addicted to that kind of cheap dopamine hit why would they want to give that up you know even though it's making them depressed and miserable and it's ruining their life incrementally because yep. the more years you do this the more the, the, the less of a payback you get for that dopamine increase. Whereas the longer you find yourself in a sort of life frame of being satisfied, the longer that goes on for, the more satisfied you are and the happier you become. Have you seen the graphs that are predicting the growth of Mormons in America? I have, yeah. Yeah, it's the only, I think it's Mormons and some other religious group. Probably the Amish or something. Yes, I think yeah. it might be. Are the only two, it's going to be, like everybody in America is going to be Mormon or Amish within the next 300 years or well, something like that. I mean, that's because we are looking literally at a population collapse and th this is the thing it's like okay well you for now can say well i don't need to and it's not my problem but actually if you going back to the sort of you know thousand year traditional inheritance that britain has well there is a form of labor that underpins that that everyone actually does owe to the civilization itself which is to reproduce and have kids this was your point who's going to look after you when you get older yeah exactly because my kids will look after me they're not going to look after some stranger because my kids love me you know and so they'll want to hopefully um you know everything keep goes playing well. your cards right with them i'm well, doing I mean my best but the, but the point is like the, there is no civilization if we don't continue it on and so this been like well i just don't want children it's like look i don't really think that's your choice actually you know i've actually got to the point where i'm like no no if you don't you will be miscarrying something that was handed to you. So you think that it's the duty of people to have children? Yes. Wow. That is that is a a forward thinking point. That's one that I haven't come across yet. Well, it's it's because it's become so evident that like it the this is one of the things that Edmund Burke always says. Like, look, the, the, the good thing about traditions is they allow us to build up a stock of good things, right? So look, laws, you know, um, you know, resources, all of these things can be built up and preserved over time. And these are passed down from generation to generation. But we've arrived at the generation that's like, actually, I don't, that's not my problem. I don't care. I'm just going to be the beneficiaries of mm. all of these things I've inherited. Without contributing to it. Exactly. And, and not even without contributing. It's one thing to not contribute, but it's another thing to destroy it. And when you say, I'm not having children, what you're saying is, I'm literally just going to obliterate the this continuity that's been going on for this time. That ends with me. And it's like, that's really goddamn arrogant. And if that's the case, why should you be the beneficiary of any of it? That's the question. What right do you have to say, I'm going to destroy this continuity? Well, perhaps that explains a little bit around why the boss bitch, lean in, hmm. disagreeable career path is becoming celebrated because you know that there isn't going to be anybody that's uh, genetically there to look after you. Mm. But if you earn 300 grand a year, perhaps you can just get yourself into a private care home when you're 75 and, and then, you, then you'll be looked after. So you are um, surrogating mm. children, or you're surrogating money for children, yeah. basically. Uh, and that, I don't know, man. I, the thing about it, like, let, like, like state pensions and stuff like this, right? Like, who do you think is paying for that? Like, someone's going to have to come after you and pay for you to be in a care home. And if you would turn around and say, well, look, I'm just not going to have children because I feel like not doing it. So, like, okay, but you are now expecting something without having put in the work. There's a certain kind of labor that is raising a family that you were relying on some other people to do for you. You selfish parasite. I can't remember the country. I want to say it's some Scandi Netherlandsy place that offers women mm. a twenty five percent reduction in their income tax for the first child. I suspect it's Denmark. Twenty five percent for the second, and then a hundred percent for the third. Oh wow! So you, if you have three children, you pay no income tax. Hungary, I think, was doing the same thing. Very well, might be. Yeah. That I mean, that's you, a great incentive. Unbelievable incentive. I would what, love it if the government would like take what, my tax away yeah, for having for your wife, not yeah. for you. Well, I, my money can go through my wife. I mean, most oh, of it goes oh, to her anyway. Look, the HMRC are listening, so let's try and 
No, no, no. You can, you can always, you can always uh, figure this out. Creative accountant. Oh yeah. My point being that to me sounds so. Look, you now have both sides mm. of what it is that you want to do. Mm. The amount of work that you do uh, contribute as a woman is maximised because you're not going to have any of it taken away by the state, sure. and you're incentivised to have children. But this is still in the Morgan Stanley paradigm, right? If we can go to the next one. This this is exactly my problem, right? Because the Morgan Stanley paradigm, this is the article I think this all comes from. Yes, it is. The rise of the she economy, right? Listen to the framing, right? In the past, educational, lower-paying occupational choices largely drove the pay gap, says one chief US economist. Today, motherhood is by far the largest contributor to the wage gap, since women who become mothers often choose to stop working or work fewer hours. It's like, okay, but we need people. We need people in the future. Yeah. You know, Demography this, is destiny. Yes, this is an obligation that only women can fulfill. And so it's like, you actually have a duty here. And so men have the obligation on a civilizational timeline to provide the resources to women to be able to raise the future, the generations of the future in order to pass down those things that we ourselves right now consider to be good that we have inherited. It's like you want a welfare state, you want, you know, like property rights, you want habeas corpus, you want any of the good things that you think we have, well, they were passed to you from history. So you have an obligation to pass that along and you need to produce people to do that. So actually, I do think we end up realising actually we have an obligation here. Well, you need to incentivize it. You're not going to go around enforcing, I mean, I, I don't know how you Jordan would... Jordan Peterson would disagree. Enforced monogamy, that wasn't what he meant. You know that's not what he meant, Carl. He, he meant culturally reinforced monogamy. I agree with that, though. Yes. I, I, I think agree. that celebrating celebrating couples, I think that Louise Perry's book, I know that you guys mm -hmm. are going to maybe do some stuff on that soon, which is amazing, yeah. by the way. People should check that out. Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Uh, loveless sex is not empowering. No. Right? You decoupled sex from making babies with the pill. That's, that's a piece of toothpaste that's not going back in the bottle, I think. Mm -hmm. But decoupling love and connection from having sex. That was something which is very, very dangerous. And somehow women are being told that this is something that they're supposed to put on a pedestal. Yeah. You should be able to outshag men. And there's articles from uh, Cosmopolitan and Elle and these girl magazines that are uh, how to sleep with a one night stand without catching feels. There's a, a, a similar <laughs> how part. How gross of is that? Dude, it's awful. Like, it's awful. How, how to disembody yourself from the person yeah. that you're literally allowing inside of you. Yeah. And uh, look, this can sound like old fuddy-duddy stuff. And I come from a background in the nightlife industry, right? So yeah. I've observed this firsthand. But I genuinely believe that it is the best way to treat yourself and the relationships that you have as if they mean something. Yeah. Does this mean that casual sex has to go out of the window? No, it doesn't. But it doesn't mean that you should throw yourself away for no reason at all. And here's the other thing as well. The adversarial relationship between men and women grows bigger and bigger if... Every time that a man has sex with a woman, it's seen like she loses and it's mm. seen like a man wins. Mm. Men have been working with women for all of time. Intrasexual competition, which is the competition within the sexes as opposed yeah. to between the sexes, is significantly higher than intersexual competition. Obviously. Women compete amongst themselves for mates, for resources to make sure that their allo parenting, shared parenting is done effectively. And men compete amongst themselves for status, for resources to make sure that they get access to the best mates. Men and women are not enemies. Every single time that something like this yeah. comes out, it suggests that they are. Every woman's gain is a man's loss and vice versa. Therefore, the, the, the zero-sum mentality means that we should continue doing this. And it's kind of mad as well. Cause it's like, okay, here's how you can outshag a man. It's like any woman, anywhere, in any time period could outshag a man because it's not how it works. Well, like men, she could she could do it, but it's going to hurt a lot more. Sure, but like the point is, like the access to sex yes. is much easier for a woman because women are the gatekeepers of access to sex because it has negative consequences if done in inappropriate ways obviously you know get pregnant have to bear a child mm -hmm. um and so it's like the the, the very cosmopolitan the, the cosmo uh like framing it's like here's how it's like that's that's like saying here's how zuby can outlift a woman yes it's like of course yes. you know this is ridiculous why would you buy a magazine like that but so but it, how to do it and not catch feels is just... It, so Louise yeah. says in her book, she talks about this uh, diary of a, a prostitute or an es escort, and she's talking about one of the first skills that you need to develop as a prostitute is how not to throw up when you're having sex with a client because what is happening to you emotionally and what is happening to you physically are things that are very difficult to mm. separate. When you think, okay, I mean, that doesn't seem like it's the sort of world that we should be pushing people <laughs> toward. 
Does it, it doesn't, does it? No, man. And then, you know, the, the final point, the, this article that I found from Business Week that was talking about this lady that was celebrating a single life and, and was happy with the no child and no family and stuff. And for some women, that is the case. There are women out there for whom this is correct. However, saying that there are costs to uh, being childless. Single women pay more in taxes. It's also significantly more difficult to get a mortgage given the fact that interest rates are on the rise. Yeah. Like, you cannot write an article about this extolling the virtues of being a boss bitch and say that the only costs are the increases in your taxes and the difficulty in getting a single person mortgage. But that, that, honestly, that is exactly the, the only framing from Morgan Stanley. Like they, they're, they're literally, literally being like, well, I mean, you know, we're, we're doing a great job to end the gender pay gap. It's like, that's totally ideological. Like, you know, nobody in the real world cares about the gender pay gap. It's totally abstract, right? But, uh, but anyway, so I, there were a couple of other things I wanted to talk about on this one. Where it's just uh, apparently uh, it's not growing older <laughs> that makes you more conservative. It's having children that makes you more conservative. And so this, as they say, uh, indicates that actually... Uh, the the people who are like absconding their duty to have children to pass on the civilization to the next generation is it any wonder that our civilization is becoming more left wing? Mm, that's very interesting. I hadn't seen that, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, they say that researchers have found that people who do not have children tend to be more socially liberal than parents, which explains uh, why pe people, which, which is counter to the idea that people just become naturally more conservative as they age. Yes. Actually, no. It's uh, as they say. There's this idea that you get older and you become conservative from experience and being bitten by the real world. That doesn't seem to be the case. If you look at people who are not parents, you do not see an age difference. And I tell you what, I think I have seen this from my own life because what it comes down to, right, is about taking responsibility for something else. And that's what all of this is about. Like, if you go back to the Morgan Stanley one, uh, sorry, the CNN one, don't worry about going back to it, but in, in there they say, oh, well, these women are, uh, the, the apparel and footwear, personal care, food and luxury uh, sectors of the economy are going to get a boost with women being single. It's like, right, so they're going to be self-indulgent. They're going to be selfish and lazy, and our civilization is going to burn up all of the good things that we've inherited that we failed to pass down because a bunch of selfish single women are going to burn it up in their own uh, pleasure, basically. That's what they're saying, right? And the, the people who are conservative are like, I need to think about setting the rules going forward for after I'm dead. That's what they're thinking about. There's like, this Donald Kingsbury quote that I always come back to that says, tradition is a set of solutions for which we have forgotten the problems. Yeah. Take the solution away and often the problem comes back just That's as big as it ever was. Exactly. And it's baby and bathwater continues to go out. And it, it, the, the kernel of truth that's at the center of a lot of these discussions, the fact that it was right for us to be able to give women equal access, to be able to go to university, to be able to go and get a job. However, when the pendulum swings way too far the other way, you go, oh, hang on a second. I mean, how much baby has been thrown out? Because that's bath and yeah. everything, the sink's gone out with it. Well, the, the concept of women having a responsibility to something that isn't themselves, is the, 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 that's the problem. Because that's what all of this is about. It's like, no, you can be a, a girl boss and have... Like, you know, all of the luxuries in the world. It's like, okay, but what do you owe to someone else? Like, oh, women don't owe anything to anyone. Yeah, you do. You owe it to your mother, to your grandmother, to your grandfather, to the previous generations. And you owe something to those people who are expected to come after you, which is producing people who will come after you. I'd be very you know? interested. I'd be very interested to hear uh, a, a critique and a breakdown of, of that because the demography is destiny thing and the, mm. the shape that you get of your population graph which at the moment is around about like that i yeah. think in the us and in the uk is like this in china which is why they're completely yeah. wrecked and is like this in a lot of the african countries you need more young people than old people they're the yeah. ones that generate gdp they're the ones that do consumer spending they're yeah. the ones that uh, do innovation and continue to drive so forward and physically they're the ones that look after the old people yeah. they, if they it's keep the, the lights on if it's the <laughs> other way around it's a very bad situation yeah. But then this leads across into the, well, you know, there's far too many people on the planet anyway and the overpopulation oh, and the nonsense. climate change and stuff. So you have this very strange sort of crossing of the streams of all mm. of these different intersecting ideologies. But I just want to grab these people like, listen, right, without people in the future, there is no civilization. You know, this collapses, the lights go off, everyone goes hungry, and it gets really bad. Well, good. Humans are a scourge on the earth anyway. We'll stop hurting and scorching the ground and we'll stop right. killing the fish and the coral reefs will come back. And so is that not some sort of insurrectionist perspective against our own existence? Human racism, Alex Epstein calls it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a prejudiced in favour of humanity. Uh, unfortunately, so am I. 
I, I, you know, I'm not very progressive in that way. <laughs> If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as the interviews we do, this one between Carl and Sebastian Gorka on The Wall for America's Soul. And you'll find out what else Carl's putting out. You can follow him on Getter at at Carl Benjamin on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.